people have a fear that, that special interest groups, wealthy individuals and the media will always decide the outcome of referendums. Are these fears warranted? I would say yes and no. When it comes to influencing a decision, of course, interests and organized and well-funded interests always have a chance to make their voices maybe better heard in the debate than others and money do play a role. But this problem is, of course, not limited to referendums. It's also exactly the same in, ele in election time. On the other side, when you uh, look into the possibility of, of having a, a say in a vote by every individual, of course, this limits a little bit the influence of the special interests if you compare to a situation where only the lobbyists have an influence on those who make the decisions, for instance, in government. So I would say referendums makes the influence of the special interests more limited than if you don't have referendums. I don't think they are. In fact, the referendum was introduced, in, especially in America, to limit the influence of special interest groups and lobbyists. And if you think of it sort of, you know, just straightforwardly in, in practical terms, then it's very easy for a lobbyist to hoodwink um, or lobby uh, a, a small number of parliamentarians, a handful of politicians, and give them sweeteners for voting for bills. It's pretty impossible. To, uh, to bribe the whole electorate. Um, so if you look at it uh, in, in those terms, then that becomes pretty much impossible. You've also seen many examples of referendums where the people have voted in favor of or against things that the elites, the press, uh, all the ones that the powers that be actually have supported. We have seen examples in Ireland where all the political parties, the press, um, interest groups, the trade unions, the employers' organisations were in favour of more European integration, whereas the people were, were opposed to it, and the people prevailed, they voted no regardless, uh, and then there was a compromise they could live with. So the referendum, contrary to, to the myth, uh, actually allows people to, to, to vote no or vote yes, and to disagree with their electorate representatives, and people aren't stupid, you know, people can once they've weighed up the, the consequences, well, if they're not too many referendums at the same time, they will be able to uh, to make decisions that are approximately uh, identical to their belief systems. Well, I, I think in any democracy, regardless of whether it's politicians making decisions, or whether it's the public making decisions, whether it's bureaucrat making decisions, special interest groups exist, and they do exert quite a substantial influence. I would argue that, in fact, it's harder for special interest groups to capture the public than it is um, the balance of power in the House of Parliament. And again, I look, I look at the alcohol legislation. We, we looked at re reform of our alcohol laws recently. The public overwhelmingly wanted some reform. They overwhelmingly wanted to see um, particularly changes around um, teen binge drinking and those sorts of things. The politicians themselves failed to deliver that, uh, and they basically adopted, uh, the majority of them adopted a sort of approach which said, oh, you know, the alcohol industry are pretty reasonable sorts of guys, and, and they'll police themselves. <laughs> Look, there are very few countries that buy that line, and certainly the public weren't buying it, but a small number of MPs uh, clearly were. So I think it's actually naive to think that Politicians, who are not very numerous, um, are immune somehow to interest groups and lobbying. I would argue that they are lobbied often um, and, and with frequency. I mean, look, I'm not even in Parliament yet, and yet I already have special interest groups and lobby groups who want to talk to me. That's because they understand all they've got to do is influence a few people.